you very much for inviting me to come and talk to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. I, I feel just as nervous as, as you evidently do. Um, so what I'm going to give you is not a standard presentation that I give. It's a one-off that I've created especially for this evening. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you are in Ashburton yesterday evening, but we had our uh, late night Christmas shopping event in Ashburton. And uh, I walked into the Ironmongers to see a poster uh, advertising this event uh, lying on the counter. And, uh, and I said to the proprietors of the Ironmongers AR Church, I said, Oh, look, look at the poster. I've never been described as a naturalist before. <laughs> and uh, earlier today, I was recounting this to my daughter, and she giggled and said, does that mean they're expecting you to run around naked? <laughs> I said, I hope not. <laughs> so, um, she reckoned the, the terms naturalist and naturist are the wrong way around. <laughs> So here we are in Ashburton, uh, this is the back of Ashburton, uh, looking up to Dartmoor with the, uh, the Ashburn Valley winding its way up to its source. So uh, no matter who I'm speaking to, I always like to just clarify uh, any doubts you might have about owl identification. And uh, owls are more often um, heard than seen, so uh, before we go any further I'm going to whip out my mobile phone in an attempt to communicate with that little device sitting on the front. And I'm going to play you some of the sounds made by these three different species of owl. The first one you'll hear is on your left, which is the little owl. the little owl. The next one's a tawny owl, is this one? So the female tawny owl normally does the ki wick, ki wick, ki wick, and the, and the male is hooting uh, in response. Sometimes you just hear the male on his own. Both species can make both sounds. Uh, sorry, both sexes can make both sounds. Okay, so here we've got a, a nestling bar now. So if you did have one in a building on a summer's evening, there was a nest there, you might just hear that sound. The street of the barn. So that was the young calling for food. Now we've got the adult. So, probably unfamiliar to most of you. Uh, it's going to do it again in a minute, and then we'll stop. Okay, so there you have it. <coughs> so, um, I expect all of you are familiar with the Tuitzawu uh, of the Tawny Owl. It's the, uh, the owl sound that is most often heard in our country. Partly because the tawny owl is the most numerous uh, owl species in the UK, and also because it's the most uh, vocal species that we have. So when people phone up the Barn Owl Trust and say, I hear owls all the time, you know, 98 times out of 100, they're hearing tawny owls. Okay. So you're probably familiar with those. You find tawny owls in virtually everywhere where you have large trees. So from parks in the middle of Plymouth and Exeter, uh, right through farmland, farmland with plenty of hedgerow trees or copses, obviously areas of woodland or forest, right up to the tree line, um, even in some of the plantations high up on the moor, you could encounter tawny owl. Uh, little owl, the first one you heard, like the barn owl, is referred to as a farmland bird, not because it needs farmland, but because it's a lowland species, it's not a bird of forest, and of course virtually all of our lowland that's not forest, is farmland. Uh, I think 70% of the UK is farmland. So we refer to the little owl and the barn owl as farmland birds. The barn owl, like the little owl, not a bird of woodland. That's another popular misconception. 
If you think you've got a good area for barn owls because you've got lots of big trees and woods, then I'm sorry, but that's not the habitat that you're going to find barn owls in. We'll talk a little bit more about habitat as we go on. So just to mention briefly some of the adaptations of the barn owl, they are an amazing species. Um, they're incredibly uh, popular amongst people. They were voted uh, Britain's second favourite bird species in an RSPB poll, um, second only to the robin. They are Britain's favourite farmland bird. Um, they are also an amazing species to study uh, because they're so highly adapted for their ecological role. The hearing of the barn owl is the most sensitive of any animal ever tested on Earth. And one of the things you probably know about them is their ability to fly silently. Silent flight, or almost silent flight, evolves because when these birds are hunting, they're not so much uh, looking for food as listening for food. They have a, a range of other adaptations as well, which I won't go into. I will just mention briefly that a wet barn owl cannot fly silently. So survival to you in barn owls is a lot to do with keeping dry. You can't expect a barn owl to just roost in the open on a tree branch as a tawny owl might do because they're not as water resistant as a tawny owl and they're adapted primarily for hunting from the air and uh, they need to be able to fly silently. So the time when you're most likely to see a barn owl uh, would be around dawn and dusk. So they are what we call crepuscular. But uh, their activity times really vary tremendously. Uh, they can be very nocturnal, particularly in other countries. If you go into mainland Europe, they'll tell you that they virtually never see barn owls during the day. Uh, whereas if you go to Norfolk and Suffolk, people will tell you they very, very often see barn owls daily, uh, active during the day. Uh, in this part of the UK, uh, a barn owl is most likely to be seen during the day, perhaps when the weather is extremely cold because small mammals become more diurnal in sub-zero conditions, and so the barn owls become more diurnal in order to, to catch them. But the peak of activity is usually quoted as just before dawn and just after dusk. So uh, I already mentioned that they're adapted for hunting when they're flying, and silent flight enables them to uh, hear the prey that they're looking for. In order to hear those small mammals on the ground, they need to stay quite low. So whereas your buzzers and kestrels can easily detect prey, primarily using their vision from perhaps 30, 40 meters up in the air, a barn owl is, is hunting uh, very, very low to the ground, typically about three, sometimes as low as two meters uh, above ground level. And also they need to go very, very slowly. If, if I said to you there's a pin on the floor, you wouldn't run around the room looking for it. You'd go very, very slowly. And so barn owls tend to fly very slowly. That helps them to fly quietly. Uh, and they do what's called portering um, when they're foraging. So they're basically flying back and forth, generally using any lift that's available. If the, uh, if the field is sloping, then they'll tend to hang in the wind uh, in a similar way to a, to a kestrel. Uh, and then move off again, but they can actually hear small mammals while they're flapping their wings, which is really quite mm -hmm. remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, they do have another way of foraging, which is called post-hopping or perch hunting, <coughs> and this is a lot to do with energy conservation. Uh, barn owls are adapted to warmer climates than we have, and when they're flying in very cold air, they lose a huge amount of heat energy. And so in the winter, they're more inclined to hunt from a perch uh, in order to conserve that energy. I just want to mention something briefly about their home ranges. Now, I would imagine that when you eventually get home tonight uh, and you crawl into bed, uh, for most of you, that will be the same bed you crawled into last night. <laughs> the quiet ones you have to watch out for. Uh, so, People generally are very regular in their habits. Uh, and barn owls are just the same as you uh, in that respect. Barn owls are not territorial. They share the area they live in with other barn owls, if there happen to be other barn owls around. And so uh, where barn owls are concerned, we never use the word territory. territory. We refer to the area they live in 
as their home range. And it is a massive, undefended area. So the land uh, it, shown in that photograph is probably smaller than the extent of a barn owl's home range. They're easily going three, four, five kilometers away uh, from their former nest site, perhaps during the winter, using the full extent of their home range, and they'll be back again by morning. A few years back, I radio tracked a barn owl from Pridham's Lee, just down the road here, and in 10 minutes it flew to Week at Dartington, and the following morning it was back again. That's six kilometers in 10 minutes. So distances like that are nothing to barn owls. Uh, they will commute across unsuitable habitats to reach uh, areas where they're foraging. Um, so if you have barn owls, uh, perhaps in a building of yours or somebody else's that you're visiting, or you might you know, poke your nose inside somebody else's building if it's beside the public footpath or something, then uh, you might notice white droppings, large white droppings on the floor underneath where the birds might have been perching. In an old barn, that would be the roof trusses. You might find patches of white droppings on the floor underneath, especially if the floor of the barn hasn't been stirred by sheltering cattle or sheep or something. Perhaps it's an old hayloft, as you can see in the photograph there, where the droppings can accumulate because the hay is there for such a long time undisturbed. Um, so the white you can see are the owl's droppings. The black lumps you can see are owl pellets, which you've probably heard of. Barn owl pellets are very distinctive. They're the only owl species pellets in the UK which are black when they're fresh. So if you see a black pellet, it's definitely uh, going to be from a barn owl. But if you want to be sure, then you just pick it up, take it home, dry it, and post it to the Barn Owl Trust. And we will identify it for you and uh, give you a phone call to tell you whether or not it is a, a barn owl pellet. Having said that, uh, please don't send us anything wet. And, uh, and if it smells really bad, it's not a barn owl pellet. Please don't send us that uh, either. Um, the other thing you'll notice in this picture are feathers. Um, barn owls molt between March and October. And if you see plenty of feathers, you know the birds have been there probably during the summer. That's a female barn owl feather, which is dark on one side, rather like this one, whereas that is a male barn owl feather. So just from looking at the signs, you can tell, we can tell, that we've had a pair roosting together in the summer. So you, in that situation, you're very likely to be in or very near a nest site. Just tell you a little bit about their breeding cycle. I don't have enough time to go into everything in detail, but I will tell you where there are sources of more information. Um, so what triggers the start of the breeding cycle in barn owls is probably increasing uh, temperature because small <coughs> mammal activity is very linked to temperature. When it's colder, small mammals are less active. Barn owls have great difficulty catching small mammals that are not active because they can't hear them. So when you get warm weather, perhaps at the end of February and March, the first really warm evenings, when I say warm, I'm talking you know, 10 degrees instead of five degrees, then uh, small mammals start to become more active and the male can find that little bit of extra food he needs in order to feed the female. Because when the pair come together, she will quickly stop hunting and uh, call him for food and expect him to hunt for her. So he will be hunting for both of them. In that photograph on the um, top left hand corner there, uh, you've got the, the female actually on the left and the male on the right. Uh, they preen each other. It's very, way, a two, very much a two way thing, the, uh, the um, pair bond reinforcement uh, in courtship. Um, you may have barn owls nesting very close to where you live and not be aware of it because they're not reliably vocal. You can have people living right next to where barn owls are nesting and they have no idea the birds are there because barn owls don't fly around making territorial screeches. The male might do a little bit of vocalization defending his mate against other males, but that's not territorial behavior. Um, but they're not dependably vocal. Um, so the eggs generally appear in uh, March, April or May. The average date of the first egg is the 17th of April. That's a month earlier than it used to be because of climate change. The average clutch size is five eggs. 
You're only going to get seven eggs if there's plenty of food. And here you've got a wood mouse, what looks like the remains of some voles as well on the edge of the nest. You'll notice they have built a nest. They've nested here before, so they're laying their eggs on a layer of their own pellet debris. But they can lay their eggs on loft insulation, on timber, on anything, really. Uh, but by the time the nesting cycle is complete, there will be a layer of what we call pellet debris or nest debris. It takes a long time for the eggs to hatch, 32 days typically. Um, so the whole process of barn house nesting is a very, very prolonged affair. The young are in the nest for eight weeks before they start to fly. So there goes three months straight away. Uh, and once the young start to fledge, they're fully fledged and looking like adults, by the time they're 10 weeks old, so there's another two weeks to add to your three months, that's three and a half months already. And then there's a period up to about 14 to 16 weeks old when the young are still dependent on the adults and still returning to the nest. So the whole cycle is easily four months, sometimes longer. Dispersal is a very, very important stage in the barn owl's life cycle, partly because there's more mortality in the dispersal phase than any other stage of life. So there's more barn owls dying when they're dispersing than, than there are dying in the nest or dying when they're older. Uh, and the reason for this partly is their uh, inexperience, but also a very strong influence is the fact that dispersing birds move further typically than the sedentary adult birds faithful to their home range and the further you move across the countryside, the more man-made hazards you encounter. And uh, young birds that are unlucky enough to encounter a dual carriageway or a motorway uh, often succumb. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about mortality in much detail. I I'll just summarise it by saying that in the first year, only around 25 to 30 percent of young barn owls will still be alive. So if you have a brood of three or a brood of four, Typically, one year later, only one of them will have survived. If you look at the, the life expectancy of all barn owls together, it's only just 18 months. So they're very, very short-lived. But if you, if you exclude the high proportion that die during the first calendar year, the average life expectancy of barn owls is four years. The longevity record in the UK is 15, the European record is 21. But the vast majority die very, very young. So if somebody says to you, well, oh, you've well, had barn owls nesting down there for years, they nest every year, that pair. <laughs> they might think they've had a pair, the same pair nesting for 20 years. In reality, in 20 years, each of those birds has probably been replaced about five or six times. So there's a huge amount of turnover in the population. And when barn owl sites become unoccupied, it's normally indicative of a lack of younger birds coming in to replace the adults that have died. So the diet of barn owls, I already mentioned that they eat small mammals. They're actually highly specialised. They don't eat worms. They don't eat rabbits. They hardly ever eat invertebrates like big beetles. Um, sometimes, for brief periods, they will specialise in eating birds if they're struggling in the winter. They might eat small waders for a while on the coast, like Dunlin. They might eat um, starlings for a while if they just happen to have a big starling roost in their winter home range. But generally, those are exceptional, uh, and most barn owls are highly specialised in eating really just three species. The field vole, as you can see in the photograph there, the field vole, the common shrew, and the wood mouse make up 82% of UK barn owl diet, just three species. So the optimum habitat for barn owls to find all this food they need, and by the way, in a typical year, a pair that breed once will use 5,000 small mammals. You can do the maths yourself. It's basically four per bird per night and the average brood size is three young in the nest. So if you work it all out, it comes out to virtually 5,000 that they're eating in a year. And the place where you can be fairly sure of finding food if you're a barn owl is what we call rough grassland. 
And to people in the world of barn owl conservation, rough grassland doesn't just mean any old bit of grassland that happens to look rough. It means something very, very specific. It means grassland with a litter layer. Now when you hear the term litter layer, you've probably only heard that before in the context of the woodland floor, the leaf litter layer. You've probably not heard that term in the context of grassland. It's not something that most people think about. But in this cross-section view, uh, cut down through the rough grassland, you can plainly see that between the soil and the living grass, the green grass, is this layer all the way through there. And what that is composed of is the previous year's grass that was not removed. Okay, so it's the grass from the previous year that collapsed and died back, and now the new growth has come up through it. The importance of this is because it provides the cover that small mammals need in order to make their what we call runs or, or tunnels. Field voles typically will tunnel through the litter there. And if we want to have stacks of field voles in our grassland, that's what we need to provide. And managing habitat for barn owls has a lot to do with retaining that all-important litter there. It's so important, I'm going to come back to it again in a little while. So, a question that is often asked is, how much rough grassland do barn owls need? Well, thanks to a, a young student at the University, University of York uh, called Nick Askew, uh, he, um, in his PhD study, produced these very, very useful figures. He produced different figures for pastoral landscapes, that's a landscape dominated by grazed grass, uh, mixed farming landscapes, and arable landscapes. This, the figures I'm giving you are the ones for pastoral landscapes because that's what we're mainly concerned with on and around uh, Dartmoor. So there you are. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot of rough grassland. Um, <laughs> so a hectare um, is two and a half acres. So you can see there we're looking at, what are we looking at? We're looking at about 100 acres, aren't we? 100 to 140 acres, something of that order, uh, within two kilometres of the nest. And uh, one mile is a kilometre and a quarter, just to give you some idea if you're not used to using uh, metric figures. It's not a massive proportion of the land, but in this photograph taken at uh, North Brent Tor, on the west side of Dartmoor, uh, you can see actually there are some decent fields of rough grass down there. When you look at habitats like that in the autumn or the winter, rough grassland really sticks out like a sore thumb. But don't be confused, don't confuse rough grassland with this. This is probably manilia. It's probably purple moor grass. You get rough grassland more where you've got um, fields that are softer grasses uh, that have been left ungrazed or uncut. So this brown coloration is probably mostly rush. Rushes growing in the grass, that's probably not rough grassland, but these fields here look quite hopeful. Of course, it's not much sense really trying to do this from a distance. You need to just get in there, get down on your knees, and look and see if there's a litter there. And when you look down into the grass, if you see horizontal, dead-looking grass, some people call <coughs> it a thatch, you can measure the depth of it with your seven-centimetre measuring stick. Everybody's got two of these. That is the perfect depth for a rough grass and litter. <laughs> One of the key things about barn owls is that their food supply and their population level is incredibly dynamic. It's changing all the time. So food availability is governed by prey numbers, obviously, but prey numbers are changing seasonally and year to year. Okay. I'm not talking too fast, am I? But I'm not trying to take that in. So, you know, small mammals don't breed in the early spring. It's really the middle of spring by the time they've really got going. So the numbers are really starting to build up by early summer, and then they're peaking probably in mid-autumn, and then quickly dying back during the, the winter, and the low trough in small mammal numbers is late winter, early spring. Okay? But you've also then got the influence of the weather. 
Barn owls can't hunt when it's raining, as I described to you already. A wet barn owl can't fly silently. And also, during snow, they can easily starve to death if the snow is deep or frozen on the top. Um, the voles, for example, absolutely love snow. It actually increases their activity. Uh, but the voles, the, sorry, the barn owls will easily starve during a, a severe winter. It doesn't need to have snow. Just very, very cold weather is enough to cause a major problem. I don't know how many of you can remember March 2013. It was the coldest period since 1962-63 and caused um, barn owl mortality to be 2.8 times higher than in a normal March. That's according to ring recoveries sent to the British Trust for Ornithology. Um, and there are annual changes as well. So some years are good for small mammals, others are poor. And so what you find is that barn owl nesting success, their productivity and their survival rate varies tremendously according to what's happening to those small mammal populations and the influence of uh, severe weather conditions. When you come on to the long-term trend in barn owl population change, then it's a lot more complex than just seasonal and annual changes because of abundance and weather. There are so many reasons why barn owls have declined. Um, I took this photograph uh, flying out of Exeter Airport some years ago, and the reason I took it is because of, of this. The bottom part of this picture is a an amazing example of a traditional farmed landscape where it looks like none of the hedgerows have been removed since the pre-war years. And if you look at it closely, you can see it's still mixed farming. So this is arable, this is pasture, this is rough grassland, there's an old barn. Uh, plenty of trees, plenty of shrubs. That will be a fantastic uh, habitat for wildlife, particularly if it's not been drained this is the kind of habitat where you might still expect to find curlew and blackwing and all those other species, some of those other species that were once common farmland birds and have now long since disappeared. Look at the northern half of the photograph, looking up towards uh, West Somerset. Then in this instance, you can see the intensive land management is arable. Of course, in the area we're talking about around the moor, we're mainly talking pastoral, and pastoral is even worse. You might think, as I once thought, that intensive arable farming is a disaster for wildlife. And it is, but it's quite often got some redeeming feature, like a, a grassy field margin. But in pastoral landscapes, as we have around here, that really is a disaster for wildlife because, well, as you probably know, because you're interested in, uh, in meadows which are wildlife rich. I'm sure you know that short ryegrass and white clover supports very, 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 very little wildlife. So what have we got? We've got the loss of uh, unimproved grassland and rough pasture, the loss of hedgerows, the switch from haymaking to silage. I mean, I, do I need to read it out? I'm sure this is stuff that you know, really. Hollow trees, when did you last see a hollow elm tree? Uh, I can remember them from my very early years. There were still some standing when I started working with barn owls in 1984. There were still a few around, but there aren't today. Uh, the redundancy of traditional agricultural buildings, the decay of them, the demolition, unsympathetic conversions, the unsuitability of modern farm buildings for barn owls, and then we've got major roads I did mention already. I haven't mentioned rodenticides, if you had to guess the proportion of barn owls in the UK that contain rat poison, given that they're mainly eating voles, shrews and mice, you might think that 10 or 20% of British barn owls contain rat poison. The latest figure, just published by the government's uh, predatory bird monitoring scheme, is 91%. That's the brand new figure, I think, from I think it's 2017, it might be 16. The numbers vary, it goes between about 78% and 94%. Um, I don't have a lot of time to talk about that, but in the questions afterwards, you might want to ask something about safer rodent control. 
flying into overhead wires, drowning in cattle troughs. There are lots of things that cause barn owl uh, mortality. So where to see one? Uh, this is a typical distribution map. Um, we've surveyed, I say we, the Barn Owl Trust, in partnership with the Devon Birds um, Society. We've surveyed the whole of Devon three times, 1993, 2003, 2013. And this is a typical distribution map of barn owls. Black ones are nesting, green ones are roost sites, um, and occasional roost sites are grey. One of the messages you might pick up from that map is that roost sites by far outnumber nest sites. So most of the places occupied by barn owls are not nest sites, they're roost sites they're still important. You can see the lack of barn owls in the Dartmoor area, and particularly what we call the Westmoor area, the area between Dartmoor and the Tamar, <coughs> is particularly poor for barn owls, as is the Blackdown Hills. Uh, so if you want to see a barn owl in Devon, the best area to go is Mid-Devon, perhaps just to the north of Crediton, where you've got quite rich mixed farming uh, habitats. Mixed farming is generally better for farm and wildlife than any extreme type. And uh, also Torridge, no, not a lot of mixed farming in Torridge, but still quite a bit of unimproved grassland and generally a wetter um, landscape than, than other areas in Devon. So on the face of it, Dartmoor was not a very good area. But this is a brand new map that we produced especially for this evening. This is just looking at uh, data, palm owl sightings recorded in the last four years. And I'm sure at the back you won't be able to read this, so I'll just tell you that uh, the red triangles, BOT sites, that means sites reported directly to the Barn Owl Trust by the public or found by the Barn Owl Trust. Uh, and sites means either a roost or a nest. Um, sightings, the green spots, are places where we've recorded, people have seen a barn owl because they've told us, or possibly we've seen one ourselves. BOS UK is up top right hand corner there, you can see barnowlsurvey.org.uk. This is our website for the public to report barn owl sightings. And so the yellow triangles are sightings of, bar sorry, sites, roost or nest sites, reported by the public online and the blue dots are sightings of barn owls reported by the public online. So once again, you can see that Dartmoor is not a particularly good area for barn owls, except for this little band going across through Coast Bridge and uh, just to the north of Prince Town. There are a few barn owls there. But the open moor is generally not quite so good. So looking more at the suitability of Dartmoor, uh, what's the problem with the open moors? Well, the main thing is the type of grassland. This is dominated, much of it, by uh, purple wall grass, millennia. And that is not a very palatable grass. It's, it's not apparently very nice, I've never tried it, but it's not very nice for voles to eat compared to some of the softer grasses you find at lower altitude and different soil types. <coughs> so here we are, there's some um, Cranmere pool. So we're looking at the, the north of Dartmoor, and it's pretty bleak. Not only is there not a, a great deal of uh, nice vole habitat, because the grass is unpalatable, but there's also obviously a lack of places for barn owls to roost and stay dry, and absolutely nowhere for barn owls to nest. So uh, on parts of Dartmoor, we do have what I call rough grazing. Uh, I took this photograph um, just to the west of Haytor, um, heading towards Rippentor. And uh, in an area like that, you think, well, now you've got some grassland, you've got enough grass to support cattle, um, but the trouble is the cattle and the ponies and the sheep. If you look at that habitat, the grass itself is actually very, very short. So we wouldn't use the term rough grassland to describe that because the grass is so short. Uh, what makes it look rough is the presence of gorse and bracken and some scrubby little oaks, maybe the odd hawthorn uh, here and there. So that will have some small mammals. It probably has some shrews because in the summer there'll be reasonable numbers of invertebrates there. 
Um, it's not likely to have field voles, or if there are, if they are there, they'll be at very, very low density. There might be a few wood mice, um, but not ever so likely, uh, unless you've got quite a few trees, perhaps producing seeds, or there's plenty of large invertebrates. So the open grassland on Darpa, well, this is Great Mist Tour, uh, a photograph that I took about a month ago. Um, and uh, it's very, very nice green grass, and you might think, well, that's a simple habitat for barn owls, uh, for field voles, etc. But again, you've got sheep up there, the grass itself is, is very, very short, and a lack of places to roost and nest. Up on some parts of the high wall, within the 300 metre contour, you have got farms, you have got enclosed grassland, but almost without exception, that's intensive grazing. Um, presumably in these fields, the surface boulders were removed years ago, uh, and the stone walls were, were made, and this allowed animals to be confined, and so you could increase the grazing density, uh, it also allows you to drive around with machinery without hitting rocks all the time. So this is quite intensive grassland management. Um, perhaps not everywhere, there might be the odd bit which is less grazed and rougher, but generally speaking, it's pretty intensive and not suitable for small mammals, uh, for barn owls. So uh, here we are, this is part of the area across Dartmoor where we do find the occasional barn owl, and this is post bridge. So perhaps its greatest advantage is that it's a mixed habitat. Mixture is, is generally good for farmland wildlife. Um, but again, you're quite hard pressed to find really uh, undergrazed areas of, of the softer grasses. I did speak to, speak to a lady only two weeks ago who came to an event at the Barnum Trust offices. And she told me that she had seen a barn owl hunting that field two weeks ago. And uh, I spoke to a gentleman uh, to the, slightly to the west of um, Post Bridge who told me that he sees a barn owl on a fence post beside the road about four or five times a year. Uh, and we've got a, a very small number of roosts and nest sites recorded uh, on that strip going across, as I said, towards uh, Princeton. Of course, around the edge of Dartmoor, we've got the valleys. A lot of them are quite heavily wooded and, and not suitable for barn owls, at least not woodland areas. But here we are, this is a farm called Easton. I think it's in the Ray Valleys. It's along the, on the eastern side of uh, Dartmoor, quite close to Manhattan. And uh, this is quite a nice example of a traditional looking farm. I mean, you haven't got any big modern agricultural buildings, you haven't got any big fields. Uh, you've got some nice softer grasses here that are obviously not grazed very much. Uh, a nice mixture, some scrubby habitat, so that potentially is a very, very valuable barn owl habitat. So what we need to do now is talk to you about actually creating some. So basically what we're looking at is changing that into that. It's not difficult. <laughs> when we started, this is a... Uh, this is a nature reserve owned and managed by the Barn Owl Trust in the Ashburn Valley. When we started, that was short ripe grass and white clover. A little bit of meadow grass, not much else. It only took two years to get the first signs of field ball. And basically all we did is we stopped the intensive grazing and we stopped the application of artificial fertilizer. And once we got the litter there, then the field ball numbers really, really took off. So, just to make that point again, uh, that seven centimetre litter there is the crucial bit. So if you think, ah, oh, you're sitting there thinking, ah, oh, I've got a bit like that, uh, what you need to do tomorrow, if it's not pouring down, you need to get out there, get down on your knees, pull the green grass apart, look down, if you can see soil, obviously no litter there. Go a metre, try again. If you keep seeing horizontal dead looking grass, measure the depth with your index finger. And when you're managing grass for barn owls, for small mammals, this is what you need to be <coughs> creating. So you might think, okay, that sounds great. I've got a little field, 
which I don't really need for my pony, or I don't really need it for anything else, I can create a whole field of, of rough grass. And there's a lovely example that I saw quite recently. You might think, well, actually, I need most of the grass that is growing on my land, <coughs> and the best I can do is to provide a grass margin. This is Holwell, um, quite near to Hantor. And here you can see that a, a cut was taken. I think it was for hay, it might have been silage. Uh, but a strip was left along the edge of the field. And uh, that can be a, all you need to do in order to create rough grassland. But of course, once you're bringing the animals back into the field, then they are going to graze it off if you don't protect it. So you might need to combine <coughs> that um, uh, margin created just by not cutting there. You might need to combine that <coughs> with the use of some electric fencing or something similar. Some of you are sitting there thinking, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute, this is not what we're all about. We are all about restoring traditional hay meadows. Well, before I came out this evening, I looked up the meaning of meadow, and at least two of the major dictionaries don't refer to it having anything to do with hay at all. They refer to meadows as being flower-rich grassland. Okay, so there are other types of meadow in the world of grassland <laughs> conservation for wildlife in the UK, this has been the fashion, recreating the, the original, you know, the old-fashioned hay meadow. Uh, this has been the fashion for many, many years now. Um, and, you know, if you can create that, great, it's so pretty, isn't it? But, you're going to destroy it. Everything that hasn't had a chance to produce seed, or everything that hasn't had a chance to hatch and hatch its egg, or young chicks, if you have a curlew chick in the grass, you're going to kill it when you mow. If you had the beginnings of a litter there, you're going to remove it when you mow. So a traditional hay meadow might be briefly fantastic for colourful flowers, it will be a nectar source, it is a wonderful thing to do, don't get me wrong, but it's not going to give you high numbers of small mammals. It's not the best that you can do for invertebrates, and it's not the best you can do for small mammals, and it's not the best that you can do for barnacles. So I think we need to shift your thinking slightly. We need a slightly different compromise. So when you're cutting your field for hay, why not leave a bit? Why not leave a bit? And it doesn't have to be a margin on the edge. It could be a patch in the middle. Now I know that is contrary to popular thinking. Popular thinking is if you're going to have a rough margin, you know, the word margin suggests it's on the edge. But we know from years of managing rough grassland that the edge is where you're going to get the problems. Rough grassland basically wants to turn into woodland. Well, all land in the UK almost without exception, wants to be woodland, doesn't it? And what we're trying to do is to halt that succession to woodland. And uh, the, the edge is where you're going to get the brambles and the, and the blackthorn suckering out into your grass, and that can become a problem for you to deal with. So you could have your hay cut all around the edge and leave a patch in the middle. Uh, field voles are perfectly capable of moving across short grass areas to get to an isolated rough patch. So, um, just want to mention something about the biodiversity benefits of rough grassland. As I think I said already, it's a much, much better habitat for invertebrates than the hay meadow, largely because it provides cover all the year round, and also because at the base of it you have rotting vegetation, and that supports a food chain. Uh, and the wildlife we see in rough grassland uh, is phenomenal, and a lot of it is to do with those high numbers of invertebrates. Uh, we get frogs right in the, out in the middle of the field, in places you'd never normally expect to find a frog. Huge increases in lizards. We have flowers. Uh, I can only show you a few of them here. This is Germanda speedwell. We have three species of buttercup, hedge bed straw. We have huge patches of crosswort. Um, musk mallow, huge patches of um, uh, birds with trefoil, 
And the, the, the very first flower of the year in February is the lesser celandine, which we have scattered through this very, very rough grass. So please don't get the idea that rough grassland can't be flowering. Um, so the number of marble and white butterflies on our site has gone from zero to almost 3,000. <coughs> we know that because we do a <coughs> weekly butterfly count set. We, count the, we physically count the butterflies on 10% of the grassland every week from uh, April to October. And so we have no doubt at all that we have massively increased the number, not only of marble whites, but ringlets, uh, small skippers, a, a range of other species. I already mentioned finding frogs right out in the middle of the field because there's so many um, worms and so many invertebrates. Massive increase in the number of common lizards. We never used to see swifts hunting over the field when it was short grass. We've counted a hundred on a late July afternoon when it's nice and warm and the inverts are all flying. Did you know that almost all invertebrates can fly? Even water boatmen can fly. So inverts are flying up out of the grassland and now we can easily count 20 swifts, sometimes 30, the most we've seen is 100 plus. This is a Devon bat species, a special species in Devon. I wonder if any of you know what it is. It's a great green, and it is great, uh, a great green bush cricket. We never saw them before we created the rough grass, and now you can easily count 50. Easily count 50 without really trying uh, to look for them. So in 2012, we produced the Barnard Conservation Handbook, and chapter five is all about habitat creation and management. And there's a table at the very end of chapter five which lists 93 species which have increased where we turn short eye grass into rough grassland with a litter there. 93 species. So basically what we need to do is we need to stop our rough grassland turning into woodland because that's what, <coughs> that's what it wants to be. So the obvious thing here is bramble invasion, but then you've got young trees popping up as well. Um, there's probably going to be big thistles there and uh, nettle beds and all kinds of different things going on. Um, so our management team at the Barnow Trust uh, is usually um, Belty Galloways. Uh, this year we had uh, South Devon Cross Limousin cattle provided by a neighbouring farmer. So if you've got a large site and you've got somebody with cattle that can graze it for you, this is the best way usually to manage rough grassland. So on our 25 acres, we have 10 or 12 head of cattle for about three months, just to give you some idea. And it's usually August to October. All right. If you don't have cattle, uh, but you do have large machinery, then you do topping. You all know the difference between a topper and a mower. So mowing is cutting at ground level. And that's what you do when you cut your hay meadow, uh, or when you cut your lawn, it's the same thing, cutting it around the <coughs> Topping is a cutter that you can set the height of, and uh, we want to see the height set at about 130 millimetres, about five inches to maintain that all-important litter there. And in this particular example, we took the photograph for the handbook because we wanted to illustrate the idea of cutting alternate strips. Uh, so you cut one, leave one, cut one, leave one, and then the following year, you cut the other ones. And this incre increases the amount of um, diversity in the sward. And again, its, it's basic function is to stop the succession to woodland. But uh, a secondary benefit is that you get a lot of grass regrowth. And the voles love nothing better than fresh sheets of grass to eat. Okay, so we also have to manage invasive species. Uh, creeping thistle. Uh, wonderful plant for butterflies. Uh, if you want to find butterflies, go and look at where they've got creeping thistle uh, in the first week of uh, July, typically, which is when the uh, grassland butterflies are usually peaking in number. Uh, so we've tried different methods of um, controlling creeping thistle, including topping and pulling and spot spraying. And uh, this winter, we're starting a three-year field trial uh, to get some positive data on the effectiveness 
of the different methods. Uh, if you've only got a small site to manage, then you can pull your creeping thistle out by hand. The problems arise more is when you've got an area that's so big, you really can't get enough volunteers, you can't do it yourself. Um, with bracken, um, bracken can be good. Before you try to eradicate bracken, you should check whether there are species that are actually benefiting from its presence. I'm sure there are uh, advisors that can come and look at your site if you're not sure. Um, the best way to manage bracken is to bash it rather than to cut it. Uh, so here we are with broom handles and volunteers out bashing the bracken. I can give you some detail on that if you want to know afterwards. If it's a very small site and you want to do cutting, then obviously you've got other options. You've got self-powered toppers that you can tow behind a quad bike, an ATV. Uh, or even on a smaller scale, you've got a strimmer or a brush cutter. <coughs> then you've got to be very, very careful to re manually regulate the height at which you're cutting. <coughs> so if you want more information on this, uh, I, I expect most of you use the internet. Uh, if you go to YouTube and you just search for Barn Owl, uh, Create Barn Owl Habitat, then that is the first thing that will come up in your search results. This is one of a number of films that we launched a year ago, uh, October 2017, um, and that will give you more information on the creation and management of the habitat. So I expect quite a number of you are interested in nest boxes. Nest boxes for barn owls are the most popular conservation measure undertaken. Uh, there are far more nest boxes for barn owls in the UK than there are barn owls to occupy them. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, there are areas that would still benefit from additional boxes and your, your place might be one of them. Um, so basically this slide is, is just trying to get across the message that barn owls use a very, very wide variety of sites. This is a brand new house where barn owls moved in through that entrance hole when the scaffolding was still up. The house was still being finished and a pair of barn owls moved in there. This is a brand new garage. The leftover sand and stone look is still there and a pair of barn owls moved in the very first spring after it was built through that round decorative hole into a tea chest and reared a brood of five. A nest box on a tree, a nest box in a modern farm building, a nest box on a pole. Basically, it doesn't matter. They just need an elevated, big, dry cavity. Uh, and this is a wildlife tower, which is a, a whole different concept, which I'm happy to answer questions on uh, later. If you have a spare £10,000 <laughs> and you want to create something that you will be remembered by, uh, then uh, this is the thing for you. Uh, the, uh, the wildlife tower that we created on our nature reserve is a memorial to John Woodland who for many years was the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology Regional Rep for Devon. So we call it the John Woodland Wildlife Tower. And uh, it stands in the, in the Lennon Legacy Project named after Vivian Lennon, who left us the land that enabled us to buy, uh, left us the money, sorry, that enabled us to buy the land in the first place. So uh, could be done as you know, mitigation for the loss of habitat in the development. That's quite popular. It could also be built as a memorial. Um, so, choosing the best place. So, if, if you've got a building that you can put a nest box in for barn owls, that's much, much better than putting the nest box on a tree or on a pole. There are various reasons for that. I can go into that in the question time if you want me to, or you can find the information online. If you've got a, a range of farm buildings, you might be thinking, well, where should, you know, which one should you choose uh, for providing your nest box? Well, the first thing I would do here is I'd actually check to see if there's already suitable places. I mean, these traditional farm buildings look like you know, the top of the wall might be level. There might even be evidence that farmers have nested on the top of the wall. Or perhaps up here there's an old hayloft or something here where there may already be some signs of barn owls. But if you're going to erect a nest box, um, this Dutch barn is just as good as the old barn. Barn owls have absolutely no sense of architecture whatsoever. <laughs> um, you know, if you're going to put a box on a pole for barn owls, you could paint it bright pink and cover it in tinsel. It wouldn't make any difference uh, on the chances of it being occupied. They really have no sense of architecture. 
So probably in this situation, I would first of all look here, maybe put a nest box up here. Uh, it's good if the entrance is overlooking open country. Maybe look in here because that open side is overlooking the open country here. That would be quite attractive to a barn owl. Or maybe go around the back of this cattle shed, create a hole in the wall and put the nest box up there. So that there's usually somewhere if you've got a building. Uh, we can talk about choosing the right tree if you want to. I'll just quickly give you a few key points. How, how am I doing for time, by the way? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, barn owls are not interested in boxes. A box is just a solid object. Barn owls are interested in holes. If you don't make the hole visible, you might as well not bother to put the box up. And you want to put it in a building where the hole into the building is visible to a barn owl just flying past by chance. You don't want the only entrance hole to be obscured by a close tree or another close building. So make sure that the way in is obvious. Okay. If you've got a little shed at the bottom of the garden, it may not be big enough. If you've got a stable block, it might just be big enough. It depends on how it's designed. There's lots and lots of different designs of nest boxes and ne there's been a revolution in the design of nest boxes in fact it started in 1997 and uh, if you're going to go to the trouble of erecting a box please please do make sure that you erect a box that is well designed and if it's going outdoors you need to erect a box that is very well designed and very well built to ensure that the contents stays dry Okay, so go for a building if you've got one. Don't worry too much about human activity or agricultural activity. Disturbance is the unexpected. Disturbance is not a noise or a vibration or a light. Disturbance is something the birds don't expect. One of the values of nest boxes is it gives the birds somewhere to hide. So when something starts to happen, it isn't flushed out of the building, it's quite likely to hide in the nest box. And because it's there, it soon realises that whatever's going on is not a direct threat. And once it's realised that, it can become accustomed to almost anything. And historically, of course, we had barn owls in church belfries. <laughs> you know, how loud are bells when you're in the belfry? Um, so, don't worry too much about human activity. You're just as likely to find barn owls in a building close to your house as you are in an isolated <coughs> building out in the sticks. Okay, they are legally protected against disturbance whilst nesting, and they are sensitive to disturbance whilst nesting, particularly during the very early stages. That's the courtship, and the egg laying, and the incubation, and when the young are being brooded. Uh, once the young are being left uncovered, they're less sensitive to disturbance, but uh, it's still illegal to disturb them. Uh, so, uh, again, that's something I can provide more advice on if you want to uh, ask a question. And the other thing I would um, just like to mention is that it would be very, very sad uh, for, for, uh, for us and for the organisers of your group to find out that after this evening, uh, you went out, you tried to put a box up, you fell off a ladder, and you're going to spend the rest of your life lying on your back, blinking to communicate with people. Uh, I'm not joking. Working at height is dangerous, and it's particularly challenging if you're not used to it. So you need to think very carefully about how you're going to safely erect your nest box. And again, the design of the box comes into that. You want a box that's not too heavy to put up safely. Probably you're going to be carrying it up a ladder. So you want a box which is quite light. And you also want a fixing method which is easy to do uh, when you're working at height. So just be a little bit careful. Don't rush into it and keep yourself safe. There's lots and lots of information available. <coughs> so again, if you go back to YouTube, and uh, if you now go to Barn Owl Trust channel, this is our channel on YouTube, 
um, you will find not only you've got that one about the habitat creation management, you've now got how to choose the best Barlow and Esbox design, how to build the Barlow and Esbox inside. Well, you can read the titles yourself. Can you read them from the back? No. No, okay. So this is how to erect a Barlow and Esbox in a building, how to build a Barlow and Esbox for a tree, how to choose the best tree for a Barlow and Esbox, uh, how to erect it in a tree, uh, and then other um, uh, subjects to do with Barlow and Esbox. Are also covered. <coughs> excuse me. Also covered in these short films. <laughs> this is what we all want. <coughs> this is what we're hoping for. I'm in danger of losing my voice now. Um, <coughs> so, <coughs> the time when your nest box is most likely to be occupied is the autumn when those dispersing young birds are finding somewhere to settle, where they're going to establish their home range and they will spend the whole of the rest of their lives in that area. Uh, so once you've got a barn owl, you will probably keep your barn owl, although within a home range, they usually have two, three or four places they roost. So they may not be in your site all the time, but once you've got them in that range, you, you hopefully will keep them and if they disappear, it's normally because they die. If you get them nesting, absolutely fantastic. Um, but it doesn't need to be a nest site in order for us to be interested. We are interested in every barn owl sighting, even if the bird is dead. Uh, information on dead barn owls is actually very, very useful for research projects. So what I'd ask you to do, if you see a barn owl, <coughs> if you are lucky enough to have one roosting in your place, uh, if you go to the Barn Owl Trust website and you've got a link there which says Report a Barn Owl Sighting and that will take you to www.barnowlsurvey.org.uk which is a, a slightly different website where you can put in your Barn Owl records. They're not published. Uh, we respect <coughs> um, people's um, uh, confidentiality uh, and uh, again you can ask more questions about that if you need to. Oh, and finally. <laughs> Did you hear what Sir David Attenborough just said in Poland? It's not enough, it's not enough to just think about your meadow, or your garden, or your parish, <coughs> or your county, or your country. It's not enough. Yes, you know, put energy into creating wildlife habitat, that's hugely valuable. But, but as well as that, you need to be thinking about minimising your environmental impact, not just when you're working for wildlife, but when you're you know, just doing what you do day to day, when you go shopping, etc. And we can all contribute to um, nature conservation in the ordinary decisions that we make. And we need to. The predictions are incredible. We are going to see much, much more um, change in, in the climate, we're going to see far more extreme weather events. Even if we stopped uh, polluting the atmosphere with carbon and other gases today, things are going to get worse. And interestingly, uh, 2018 is going to be uh, the year where we released more carbon into the atmosphere than any other year in history. Uh, half of the carbon that we've released into the atmosphere we've released in just the last 25 years. The, the problem is getting worse and worse and worse. We are going to see mass migration as we see increasing crop failure. The global food output has already been reduced by 5% because of climate change. So climate change is, is in reducing our productivity of our own food and the result is bound to be mass migration, particularly from areas that are unbearably hot and where food just simply can't be produced 
in any quantity. I'm thinking of the equator and the subtropics. It's been estimated that by, two th by 2050, so in 32 years' time, we are going to need to produce 50% more food to feed the world's population than we're currently producing. By then, it's reckoned that there will be 10 billion people on Earth rather than 7 point something we have at the moment. So it's inevitable that we're going to see more habitat destruction. And so your little island, your meadow, your little islands of, of paradise for wildlife are going to become even more important in the future than they are today. And the pressure on you to grow vegetables in that meadow may become huge, if not during your lifetime, during your children's lifetime. I don't want to labour the point. I hope, I hope and pray that this is something that you're all already aware of. Temperature is rising ten times faster than it's ever risen in recorded history. So, have you heard of that? Have you heard of that? 2017, 2018, this is new science, this is new results coming out. We are in the middle of the sixth time that there's been mass extinction events happening on the planet. This is the first time, of course, it's been caused by one species. Why? Why is this happening? Of course it's happening because protecting the environment has not been mankind's priority. So what should our priorities be for the future? I think for all of us, our top priority is always going to be our family. If times get really, really hard, you are probably going to do more for your family than you would for anybody else or anything else. If you're lucky enough to have really good friends, special friendship is, is a wonderful thing. It's something you will treasure and you will do things for your friends that you wouldn't do for other people. They're always going to be your priority, your family and your friends. <laughs> Second to those, <coughs> my suggestion is that for all of you, your next priority should be the environment. Every time you vote, <coughs> every time you choose a product. Thank you very much. <laughs>
on that exact subject. Um, we're not short of ideas of things that we'd like to do. What we're short of is, is the resources to do it all. So we have a, a limited amount that we can do. It's a great idea. Um, I read all the information in the, in the Plant Life campaign uh, that I got hold of, and um, I do have some concerns about it, um, because what they're talking about is um, stopping the cutting of, the early cutting of grass verges, so that plants like orchids have time to produce their seed, <coughs> which is a wonderful idea. But if we have more rough grassland on road verges, we're going to have more barn owls dying on roads because they will frequent the roadways more if there's more cover for small mammals. Um, so we did a huge research project on major roads and barn owls. And uh, one of our recommendations from that is that if you want to have rough grassland on verges, I'm talking large verges now, um, then that's fine, but you should have it behind a screen. So rather than having the high trees set back and then a bit of scrub and a bit of bramble and then rough grass and then short grass and then a bit of gravel and then the road, you basically flip it over the other way. So you have the road and then you have tall shrubs or, or trees and then you have your scrub and then you have your rough grass down for your, for your uh, reptiles, amphibians, Deptford pinks, whatever you want to have there, great but screen the roads to stop birds flying across at low level. It's a big subject, which I don't think we have time to go into in any more detail, but what you said is a great idea. Have a look at plant life. Have a look at their campaign. All right? Yes. Uh, <coughs> can I ask, is it better to top once a year rather than, be, can you, or do you, can you leave it totally? to get on with itself. Yes, you can leave it totally. Which but the, is better? the idea that you can conserve uh, or, yeah, the idea you can conserve wildlife by leaving land alone, um, you know, it's quite a popular idea because a lot of people think that the big problem for wildlife is disturbance. And when you manage habitats, you're basically killing stuff, you're cutting stuff, you're destroying stuff. But you're doing it for good reason. As I think I've mentioned, if you leave the land alone, it's going to become overgrown and it's going to turn into woodland. You cannot maintain grassland, be it a hay meadow or a rough grassland, without stopping the succession. And so by all means, leave it completely uncut for the first two or three years. Once you've got your vault in there, that will be great. But around the edge, you'll notice that the scrub is starting to come in already and you do need to graze it or top it as I described. So it is best at the top, once a year? It, the, as I described, yeah. the best, if it's a large area and, and you've got cattle available, that's the best form of management. If, it's, uh, if cattle aren't available, use a topper. If it's a small site, you know, use smaller equipment to cut at about 130 millimetres above the ground. Is there an ideal time to top? Um, yes, it depends what you're topping for. If you're topping to control bracket or creeping thistle, then you normally would do it around the 7th of July. Um, it's unfortunate that it is the same as the peak in farmland butterflies, uh, and also you see a lot of great green bush crickets when you're out there doing that. But if you don't do that at the most effective time, then you are going to end up with a field that is covered in bracken or covered in creeping thistle. And it depends really what you're managing for. If, if invasive species are not an issue, then top later, top in the autumn. That would be fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I'm just being reminded of something at the front here. Um, hold that thought. Um, I think you mentioned spot spraying for something. Yes. I might have got that wrong, but I wondered what you use when you're spot spraying. Yeah, we, we hate it. Um, <coughs> we don't want to do it. But um, we do have a problem with creeping thistle. We have been topping it and pulling it with volunteers for years, and we basically were keeping pace with it. We were getting more and more and more creeping thistle. And then we uh, accidentally met the chairman of Butterfly Conservation in Cornwall, and he said, oh, come, come down and look at my site, which we did. 
and he uh, described how he spot sprayed the creeping thistle uh, to stop them taking over. Uh, and we thought, well, we'll give it a try. So we use, uh, we've used knapsack sprayers with a chemical, the product name is Grazon 90 or Grazon Pro. It's a selective herbicide. We did consider using glyphosate, which is probably less toxic, but uh, the trouble with glyphosate is it kills everything it lands on. We didn't want to have brown spots of dead vegetation in our field. Um, and I mentioned, I think, earlier that uh, we're now starting a three-year uh, scientific uh, control experiment to uh, test the relative effectiveness of different ways of controlling creeping thistle. And the reason we're doing that is because we don't want to spray. We, what we're determined to try and find another way which is as effective or at least as effective and practical and affordable. Mm. What about scything? Sorry? What about scything? Scything, yes. It, it, anything you do by hand is always better, isn't it? I love, you know, there, there are societies dedicated to scything now. <laughs> love it, absolutely love it. But when you've got three volunteers and 25 acres, <laughs> you just can't do it. It just, there aren't the resources. It's like hedge lane. You know, hedge lane, an absolutely wonderful thing to do, but, you know, given the costs of labour these days, it's impossible to lay all the hedges in Devon. You can only do a little bit uh, when you're doing stuff by hand. It's a sad reality. Thank you. Uh, so one of the uh, boxes that you had uh, on the picture had a, a quite a big ledge on it. I'd, I'd yes. heard that actually you just leave the hole for them to fly straight in because they're the only birds that can fly straight in. Yes. It was the ledge. Yes, okay. So the, um, the, uh, the tray, if you like, on the front of the nest box, we, we call it an exercise platform and it's not needed by the adults. Uh, as you described, the adults are capable of just flying straight in. They don't need it at all. The reason we have an exercise platform is to try and uh, reduce the occurrence of young barn owls falling from the nest box before they're ready to fly. So what they want to do when they're about seven and a half weeks old, they jump up to the entrance hole, um, trying to get out and possibly trying to see uh, so they can be out there and so they can be first when the food is being delivered by the adults. And, uh, and if they jump up and, and what they're faced with is a 15 foot drop, um, then it's really, really dangerous because at that age they can't fly. Uh, and you can have a bird that jumps up, stands in the entrance hole, and then another one decides to jump up and it, it, it topples out. So the way around that, firstly, is to make sure your nest box is deep inside. Um, and this is the most important thing with, with nest box design is that internal depth. So low entrance holes are a thing of the past now, or at least they should be. So you have the depth and you have the exercise platform on the outside uh, to, to combat that, that problem. All right, there's, there's lots of information out there about it. Time wise, I think we'll move this. Sorry, guys, about the, the, the habits of the European birds being more nocturnal than yeah. a la crocoscular. Is yeah. there any good reason for that? No, I don't know why. No, good reason. no I mean, the, the robin in France is a very shy bird. I've heard it's the robin in this country is a quite a bold bird that will yeah, come yeah, sit on your, your fork. <laughs> no, so, so you shoot them there are, but you do have instances where you have the same species. You know, in different areas, and they, they, for some reason, start to behave differently. That's quite well recorded in wild birds. I've heard with the robin, it's because um, they have wild boar, and they disturb the ground more, and we are the wild boar <coughs> as gardeners. Okay. 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 So, do take the last question. Just jump about there. Did you still have a question? Yes. Um, I was just about to say, you were talking about the creeping thistle. If you allow the creeping thistle to nearly flower, and then cut it off at about eight to ten inches, the water will put in a stem and rot it, and then it will die. Yeah, that's a lovely idea. Um, a cut in June is a cut too soon, and a cut in July, they're sure to die. And, uh, and that's what we did for years, and it didn't work. <laughs> Um, so, well, I, I don't want to completely to dismiss your, your idea. I'm, I'm sure that in all these things there's usually a grain of truth. 
uh, and it may be in some situations that would work. In our situation, it didn't work. It might be to do with uh, the, the amount of root that's in the ground, because you know, creeping means they're, they're doing what blackthorn do. They send a root out a couple of inches under the ground and then pop up somewhere else. And I think if you've got a lot of that living root system, no amount of cutting is gonna make much difference. But if perhaps you haven't got that, uh, to the same extent, maybe what you're suggesting would be more effective. I don't know. The other possibility is that new seed from the creeping thistles is causing new plants to come up. Although apparently the productivity from new seed in creeping thistle is incredibly low. They mainly spread by suckering. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so, I, yeah, sorry, sorry, I had this thing I had to mention. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the nature reserve I showed you and referred to is, uh, we call it the Lennon Legacy Project. Uh, it's next to the Barnard Trust offices, and we do have guided walks there. We have our butterfly walk every year in the first week of July, and we also have groups coming uh, in an organised way to have a guided walk as well. So if that's something you're interested in, we would love you to come have a look. Maybe not all of you at once, <laughs> um, but in, in you know, about 15 people at a time, we would absolutely love to show you around. So it's well, it's not a visitor centre, yeah. um, but uh, it's uh, at, uh, adjacent to Waterlead. So it's uh, a mile and a half up the Ashburn Valley. Okay. Um, on behalf of the Moor Meadows Group, can I just thank everyone for coming out on this horrible night, which is obviously not very good for our hours either. Um, thank you for that, and thank you again, David. Very informative. So.